And so before we get out of here, though, we got. Um, yeah, we, we, I still got some time. Got, all right. Um, you got some other stuff going with some heavy hitters. Pesci, Stallone, what's happening with that crew? Yeah, so um, I've uh, been so lucky to. I really. I, I was able to take a, a really negative situation, frankly, which was my involvement in the White Boy Rick um, film, which just was my dream come true. And it's like, be careful what you wish for. Because you get it. And, uh, you know, my, my reporting and uh, researching and writing and expertise gets optioned for a Hollywood film with Matthew McConaughey and $40 million budget for, a, for an right. adult rated R movie which for people that don't understand Hollywood right now that does, does, does not happen right. you either you're, you it's either a superhero movie that's with a 200 million dollar budget or it's an independent movie with a budget of 10 million dollars or less correct and nobody's making 30 million dollar 40 million dollar adult oriented pictures anymore but there was so much confidence in this story that's what we got and again it was just the producers were all academy award winning producers I was so excited. I, I was running towards the project, like you know, like I, like my pants were on fire. I couldn't wait. And then it was, uh, it really was. It was two two and a half years of of uh, just discomfort and um, disharmony, and uh, just saw all the negative parts of Hollywood that you hear about. Um, so it's a it's a viper's den, man. But the pe the pedal the pendulum so, has swung, right? So the the reason I'm saying that is, I, I made a lot of networking contacts through my initial delve into Hollywood and the entertainment industry, which was in 2015 when the White Boy Rick project mm -hmm. uh, uh, got off the ground. Film came out in eighteen. Yep. Um, but from my relationship with Sony um, and meeting other people uh, doing business out there, I've been able to parlay it into other projects, which are, you know, it's really, you just, you know, you got to make, you know, it's cliche. You got to make lemons out of lemonade. Yeah, make lemons right? out of lemonade, man. Uh, no, make lemonade out of lemons. Sorry. There you go. I, I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. So uh, I, um, yeah. I got hired on right before the pandemic. Um, I was hired by Balboa Productions, which is Sylvester Stallone's production outfit. And he wanted me to create source material for him for a television show, mm -hmm. uh, which was which is going to be a limited uh, limited run exclusive series, uh, ten parts. Uh, most likely, it's going to be on HBO Max. Okay, um, we'll start. Awesome. Hopefully we'll start shooting in uh, spring or summer of, of, of 22. But uh, it's produced and directed by Sylvester Stallone. Uh, Joe Pesci is his uh, partner on this in, in a co-production deal with HBO Max. And then Pesci's also going to star or co-star in, in the picture or in the, in the television series. And it's the story. It's a true story of uh, Greg Scarpa. For people that don't know who that is, um, Greg Scarpa was a sociopath, mob, enforcer, hitman out of the Colombo crime family in New York City who was given a license to kill by the FBI and the CIA because he was a CIA asset. And wow. was working wow. for both the CIA and the FBI from the early '60s um, into the early '90s, uh, and they were taking him from from Brooklyn mm -hmm. and sending him like overseas to do like black ops. And when he would come back, they basically were like, "You've helped us so much in all these other endeavors. You have a license to kill." Uh, and he was getting help from the FBI to like track down his rivals, and it was a lot like Whitey Bulger, but even worse. Um, and <laughs> one of the most historically significant things that he did at the behest of the government, which is at the center of this uh, television series, limited run series, was that if anybody saw the movie Mississippi Burning, 
which was based on the civil rights of the murders of three civil Summer Swartz and Summer uh, It's and um, uh, Schwart, uh, Cheney. Ma- Mickey Schwart, uh, James Cheney, uh, uh, Andrew Goodman, and Goodman. Mickey Schwartz. Schwarmer. Schwartz. 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 I'm calling them, thinking of the law firm. I have, yeah. I've, yeah. And it was yeah. uh, the summer of 1964, and uh, the presidential election was coming up in the fall, yeah. and you had uh, uh, the, the, the leaders of the New York uh, NAACP come to, no, sorry, leaders of young Democrats or something, the, 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 these leaders of, uh, of, of in New York, uh, Drew Goodman and Mickey Schwarmer, uh, were leaders of a uh, of some type of uh, so- activist group. social justice activist group in New York. They they came down to Mississippi for the summer, not just for like a week, but they came down for the whole summer from May. Uh, they were I think they were juniors in college uh, and came down to to Freedom Ride and to get uh, uh, work with the NAACP in Mississippi to get voters registered. Right, right, right. And James Cheney was the president of the junior NAACP in Mississippi. Mississippi. And uh, the three of them were kidnapped and brutally murdered. And the case was eventually solved, and that's what Mississippi Burning is about. But you, you've, up until about 10 years ago when the uh, FBI documents were finally declassified, you didn't know how they were solved. Um, the Mississippi Burning gives you a, a very sanitized version of it. Right, uh, the Gene Hackman character in there, they yeah. do show using some, right. and the, shall we say, aggressive yes. interrogation techniques. Right, and in reality, the person that was using those aggressive interrogation tactics was Your Greg man. Scarpa, oh. a.k.a. the Grim Reaper. That was his nickname on the street of uh, New York. So the, the, show's t- uh, t- uh, the show is titled The Grim Reaper, and uh, the first half of the show is going to take place in Mississippi, in 1964, in the aftermath of the civil rights uh, workers being murdered, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI call for their ace in the hole, which is Greg Scarpa, who at the time is in his early 30s and is, is rising up the ranks of the Colombo crime family uh, underneath Joe Colombo and Carmine the Snake Persico. And uh, they, they bring him down to Mississippi. He brings his, his teenage, he is, he's married at that point, but he has a teenage girlfriend. Brings his 17-year-old teenage girlfriend down to Mississippi. They check into a hotel. Uh, he tells his uh, uh, girlfriend, you know, sit tight for the next week or two. I'll be back periodically. Yeah. And uh, gets deputized. Down to Mississippi. Down to Mississippi. And they're basically like, do whatever you need to do to, to, to get us these bodies. So they needed to find the bodies. Right, right. And they needed to find who was responsible, which was the Ku Klux Klan. Right. And... Um, Interestingly enough, the uh, in the months before, you had a changeover in leadership in the Ku Klux Klan um, to this guy named Sam Bowers, who advocated for a fundamental shift in the way that the Ku Klux Klan did business. And he, he made a, a, very, a very famous, well, in the world of the Ku Klux Klan, mm-hmm. famous speech um, in the months leading up to these civil rights uh, slains where he said we're done uh, burning crosses on lawns we're done walking around in pointy white hats that's that's counterproductive right. um, we're going to blend in to society we're going to infiltrate mainstream business we're going to be stealth and we're going to kill For, uh, he, he basically said what's the point of burning a cross like right. wouldn't right. it be better to have Ted Ted Duke Ted Ted de- uh, de- or 10 Dead people to yeah. make your same point, point that you would make. I the, don't. Yeah, yeah. So they, there was a a campaign of violence that was um, unleashed uh, on uh, in Mississippi over that summer, and it wasn't just the those civil rights workers. Um, the the head of the 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 president of not the junior NAACP, but the head of the NAACP in Mississippi uh, was murdered, and. Uh, oh my God. And uh, 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 one of the leading Jewish Viola, uh, one of the leading oh. Jewish um, religious leaders in Mississippi was murdered. So there were there were five murders that summer tied to this Sam Bowers, who was more of a mafia don. He he had a, a history with the Dixie Mafia, and he he 
structured the Mississippi Ku Klux Klan in in the format of a organized crime uh, uh, group than the traditional. Now, do you guys unpack this guy yes. and this story? So in- Joe Pat, oh, I don't. Joe, Joe, there's rumors that Joe Pesci will be playing Sam Bowers. Wow! And wow. Uh, we're we're in the process of casting um, the lead. Uh, wow, that's so gonna yeah, be hot. So the, first, so the first half takes place in Mississippi, and then the second half takes place in New York when he comes home, and it's like he's got ho- he's playing with house money for the ne- for the rest of his career in the mob because of what he had done. Just that alone, not to mention the stuff he had been doing overseas. But breaking that Mississippi yeah. case solidified yeah. his relationship with the government, so, which gave him his green light to go do whatever so he needed to do. And then he was at the center of um, this huge, the last big New York mafia war uh, in the 1990s was the Colombo uh, Mafia War. It lasted from 91 to 94, and and Greg Scarpa was one of the, the generals. Uh, and, and at the time, he was dying of AIDS, uh, mm. which is another part of the story where this... This guy was such a racist, which also adds context and nuance to the fact that he went down and uh, helped solve these these uh, historic civil rights murders. But he was not someone who liked black people. Uh, <laughs> he was he was a you know a businessman and uh, yeah. was was uh, you know, paid for it too. I mean, he was getting paid for all. Oh, obviously, yeah. yeah. But uh, he had an ulcer and um, needed a blood transfusion. And no. refused to use blood from the hospital because he was worried it would be Hispanic or black or Jewish blood. Uh, he, he wanted Italian blood, so he had the members of his crew all give blood to see who, who he matched up with. He happened to match up with this guy named Billy Maley, who had a perfect match for the blood, but was also a drug user, oops, and a heroin abuser, yes. oops. And gave him uh, tainted blood. And the end of the story is a, and if you saw Greg Scarpa in the 70s, he is the picture of masculinity and, um, you know, 6'2", 250 pounds, the hands, the, you know, the size of you know, ham hocks. And right. uh, by 1994, when he's out in the street actively shooting other members of his crime family, he's down to like 110 pounds. He, he lost his eye in one of the, the shootouts in this war. And he's commanding like a brigade of mob soldiers uh, wow. dying of AIDS, being tipped off by the FBI where his enemies were. Eventually he, he gets arrested, the FBI gets outed, and then he died very shortly thereafter. In prison, I think he only had to do about six months before he died. But uh, it's been a passion project for Stallone. He's been trying to do uh, a story about Scarpa for about twenty years. Okay, and uh, mm-hmm. hopefully this will coming be, home. This this will be the one. So. Wow, Sounds wow. Like only your big boss. So you gotta have the right friends, fam, out there. I'll we, tell. I'll give you one know. anecdote, even though you didn't ask. Exactly. But I like this. Is, right. It shows you what a uh, uh, to me. I, I've, I'm, I'm so appreciative of someone like Sylvester Stallone giving me an opportunity to work with him and to meet to meet him um, and uh, Rocky right and, <laughs> say no uh, more Rambo. Rocky yeah, yeah. Rambo right? So, like, right, no, that, so this is what you just said and I'm going to play off it so I, we're on a Zoom call and this is right at the early part of the pandemic we're all on a Zoom call and uh, he's right in front of me on the Zoom and uh, they throw it to me and they're like, all right, Scott, uh, you know, break down for Sly, you know, what you just wrote or whatever. And then I was like, um, so what, what What? should I call you? I was like, do you want me to call you Mr. Stallone? You want me to call you Sly? He's like, Scott, you can call me Rocky. You yeah. can call me Rambo. Uh-huh. You can call me Sly. Uh-huh. You can call me Mr. Stallone. Whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> 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 that was like, uh, awesome. Ah, uh, that is classic. Yeah. Um, 
It was just time to really tell a great untold Detroit story because it kind of covers Detroit at its, at its zenith. Very interesting story. All right, Rich Rossi with you and with Motown Mafia. I'm with Courtney. Lewis Stevens. Lewis Stevens, Courtney. Brown. Uh, Courtney Brown Jr. And uh, Alan, Al Prophet Bradley. And this is an entrepreneurial, inspirational story too, because again, you know, I'm a real estate retail guy. You know, that's what my skill set is. Um, but I'm a businessman, so I was like, you know, we just, we're gonna do it. You know, sometimes when you got a dream, you won't have all the answers on how you're gonna do what you're gonna do. But what made this one unique was not so much the crime, but the intertwining with Detroit's history and the Motown era and kind of the economic decline of Detroit. And it's really the story of uh, a family. And from some perspectives, it has a happy ending, like you said. For others, it didn't have a happy, <laughs> happy ending. Right, right.